Hello my outstanding friends, it's Roger once again and today we're going to be talking about Emanuel Velikovsky's Worlds in Collision, which was a book that was written about a cataclysm that happened to the earth in 1500 BC. And this is Carl Sagan wrote a book, it's called A Scientist looks at Velikovsky's world in collision. Now, so he's, this is Carl Sagan. Now, this is uh, 1980. And he said, in the spring of 1940, Emanuel Velikovsky's study of the biblical accounts of the Exodus led him to conclude that a great physical catastrophe had befallen the earth at the time of Moses. He soon located references to what he believed to be the same event in historical text, epics, myths, folklore, and papyruses and carvings and all in the museums. I followed him very closely and a number of ancient peoples. They all had the same story. Since conventional scientific theory made no allowance for this cataclysm in historical times, Velikovsky began revising astronomy and geolo geology as well as ancient history. So he, he overturned turned everything and they just went insane. The results of his labors were Worlds in Collision, 1950, dealing primarily with his theories of cosmic collisions within the solar system during historical times. Now this was 1500 BC. So it's only 3,500 years ago. We're not talking about a long time ago. And I, I can pretty much prove this is, at this point, I think I can prove what he said was correct. Then he followed some other books, Ages and Chaos, and presented his revised synchronisms for ancient history from the 15th through the 7th centuries. This is when you had the sea peoples. Nobody could understand. Where do sea peoples come from? They came after the cataclysm. Later, Velikovsky gave his geological theories more detailed treatment in Earth in upheaval and continued his historic revision in Oedipus and Akhenaten in 1960, and then the peoples of the sea, the sea peoples. This is when they never could figure out where these people came from. They came from the result of the cataclysm, and the result of the cataclysm was an almost an impact on Earth by a giant comet, which is actually Venus. Okay, this is the Sun and this is the Earth. Right, obviously, they're not proportional. The Sun is way out there and the Earth is much smaller and so forth. However, what I want you to take away from this is the interaction of the particles that are in space, that are emitted from the sun, and every other luminous body sends out photons, electrons, tiny little dust particles, this, this hazy little emission. And it primarily, it's loaded with electrons. That's why we have what is called an ionosphere. And it's way out at the edge of our atmosphere. And an ionosphere, ions, mean negative particles, negatively charged particles in this case. Ions are charged particles. In this case, they are negatively charged, just totally flushed with negative charges out here. And so that's why we scrub against all the other negative charges. And they're not just here where the sun points at us. They're all over here, too, because this light sends them everywhere. And they're everywhere in the universe is completely saturated with light. They're not packed tight like they are on Earth because of our gravitational influence, but they are literally a soup of, a, a, you know, a, a misty soup. Let's go with that. All right, so we have a misty soup out here, a little sort of misty looking soup. And here we are scrubbing through it. Our electrons are scrubbing through those misty soup electrons, just like this. Well, here's what would happen. If you took a body similar to our Earth size and hit against our Earth, all right, not hit it exactly, but caromed off it, where it came down, bam, and bounced off this way. And atmospheres against atmospheres are going to do that because their electrons will be the same as ours. They're going to have negatives everywhere around them. We have negatives everywhere around us as it impacts a push-to-push. -push. 
It's a push to shove. They boom, and it's going to bounce off and go flying in a, you know, sort of skim off us. But this is the interaction. I would call that cleaving the atmosphere. Now let's see if there's anything we can see about that in history. Now before we do that though, don't forget now, this cleaving of push to shove of electrons, that is nothing more than energy. Anytime you push two things together, you create energy. You scrub, you rub. I could feel that heat instantly. And you will, it, it, that is the instant heat of compression. Um, there's a law, let me show you about it. Now I do light research and I can absolutely guarantee you light is a particle and that is the particle. This is the red pulsed laser. Each one of those is a pulse from the laser and each one of those has photons in, in it. I don't know how many but it has at least one. And as it comes through here its field which is huge compared to the particle. The particle is quite tiny and it's the 2P2H particle which they know about, it, it exists and they don't know how to create it, and they, but they have seen it make excess energy, which it will, when it explodes right here at the Venturi. Now, they look for them out here in outer space. This is what's called muons. When they break apart, that black and white ball, when they break apart, they become muons and electron showers. And that is it right there. The black balls are around the outside. The white is the only thing that comes through there. And it is obviously accelerated. It obviously split. I'll show you the split right here. And it also what CERN is looking for. There's a split. That's fission. That's fusion. Boom. We should be able to fix the world's energy problem tomorrow if they would just listen. There's the muon neutrino, electron neutrino. It creates a black ball to muon. The electron shower, electron shower. Now, what's coming from space? Light. It's, <laughs> this is what light was. It impacts. It glows like crazy. That's why we. That's why we're lit up all the time. Now, what also does it do? It fills the the universe with particles. Everything that illuminates is a particle. They're not nothing. They're particles. So what does that mean? They're magnetic particles, and I show them as little magnetic particles when the black and whites are attached. That means that as everything else goes through the space, it slows down. It's not redshifted because we're expanding space. No, it's redshifted because it's slowing down, redshifting, which means it's getting slower. So there's a problem with Hubble. We got a problem with Einstein because we can accelerate light. We got a fair problem with Fermi Lab because they refused to talk to me about the muons and electron showers, which I just showed you because we did it so cheap. Now, there's a ton more to go over here, but let's just continue with Velikovsky and what did originally happen. And what originally happened was there was a, a planet-sized comet. Let's take a white one because it was white. Hold on, we got a white one around here somewhere. Oh, uh, maybe not. All right, well, we'll go with the dark star. All right, so here we are spinning through space like this. This thing comes out of nowhere, land, bam, and it hits our atmosphere. Now, it has an atmosphere, too. It can't not have an atmosphere. Everything has a, a surrounding atmosphere, which we have, and these light particles coming from space, I showed them up as little springs, so that they, you can see one of them goes a little slower, and this one goes faster. And that means this one's going to be blue or, or green, and this one's going to be red or yellow or, or that type of thing. It's it's the frequency of the spin determines the, and, and the ones from the, determines the, the color. The ones from the moon are reflective, so they're only you can only get like red from the moon. Now, here comes Venus. Pow! At that point, whatever is in that region where it's initially concussing is absolutely devastation. Now. The rest of the Earth will absolutely be wrenched as well. And it could very quite easily hit and push our atmosphere so violently that it, the Earth would literally stand still. It would say, and they would say, no, 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 and boom, this would go away. And then it would take off again. And why would it take off again? Because we are being dragged through space trying to catch up to the sun. We have to go forward. As we go forward, we roll against space. We roll against space, like just like a, a, a car tire. Oops, I'm sorry. Go this way. We go this way. 
because we're going forward, we're rolling. Now, what happened with Venus? Venus is just the opposite. Venus is going in the same direction, but it's going backwards. We're going this way, rolling right, like just rolling right along like this. Well, Venus is coming this way, only its tires are spinning backwards. It's scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. Venus is 850 degrees. So that's the problem. It's not gas house, greenhouse gases. And they're going to send some, like I, a ton of probes to, to, to Venus to try to figure out why it's so hot. It's so hot because it's scrubbing backwards through all these particles that are in space. And there is a ton of them. Our ionosphere is 2,700 degrees. That's why it's so hot out there. Venus is hot because it's scrubbing so hard backwards that it's 850 degrees just on the surface. Now, we have to start and think about what we're doing and what we're spending all this enormous quantities of money on, not understanding anything. I'm showing you the muon, I'm showing you electron showers, I'm showing you electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and dark matter, because the black is a dark matter. It does, no, it does not concuss, it does not emit, it does not absorb, it does not reflect, and now I can tell you it does not concuss and crush. The black does. And that's why the black can't, I mean, I'm sorry, the white can, can crush. The black cannot crush. The black comes through here and it, the, it just bangs and it bounces back here. You have to have this exactly perfect, this venturi. And then this is what the result you'll get is, is fission and fusion. Right here is 200 times more energy than we started with. We should be able to get free energy tomorrow. If if Carl Sagan and his his crew, these type of, type of people, will listen to people that are coming from the most strange places, as Carl Sagan would say. Okay, this is Carl Sagan again, and um, he's passed, so he's not anybody I can debate with, but I will talk about his interpretations and what I think is probably more correct. To eject planets or comets. If one did enter the inner solar system, there is no way it could stop the Earth from rotating. And if it could, there's no way the Earth could start up rotating again at anything. Okay, I disagree with that, Carl. Um, the Earth would be pushed back by the magnetic interactions between their field and our field, and it would... And I think you could stop it. And it would cause all kinds of catastrophe and flooding on the Earth. Plus, the impact of the electron to electron mass, ionospheres to ionosphere, basically, would create enormous electrical discharges and extreme amounts of heat, which is exactly what Velikovsky said. So, and also, Venus is spinning in a reverse direction to all the other planets. We're all going around the sun the right, same way. But we are rolling around the sun in a correct manner that doesn't scrub. So we're like going down the street with our tires just the way it should go. Well, Venus is going down the same street, but instead of the tires going this way, the tires are going this way. <laughs> And it's going down the street. It's 850 degrees. They had no clue about this back when Velikovsky made all these predictions. He made all the exact correct predictions. And they really destroyed him. And, you know, he's got this cosmos and he came on and he said, well, this is totally wrong. The guy's totally wrong. But we should listen to him. Well, they don't listen here. Thing like 24 hours a day. There's no geological evidence for flooding and volcanism 3,500 years. Yes, there is. I ha everything that I have that is my mud fossils came from the surface, not deep under the ground, on top of the surface. They were parboiled, and then when they dried out, they were absolutely flawless, as I have shown you, or will. Here's it go. Babylonian astronomers observed Venus in its present stable orbit. Uh, before Velikovsky said it existed. I don't believe that. Can you show me evidence of that? These are the kind of things they come up with and they just spew them out. Where's your evidence? Velikovsky presented the evidence, Carl. It wasn't just, oh, they all, oh, they must have said that. Because somebody's going to see something. It's, oh, there was, that's Venus right there, absolutely. And some of the 
you know, uh, astrological drawings. I mean, there's no way you can make sense of them now, especially now because things are not in the same places. <laughs> and so on. There are many hypotheses in science which are wrong. That's perfectly right. It's the aperture to finding out what's right. That's the aperture to finding out what's right. You have to examine them rather than to discount them before they're examined. Now, that's what, what would have happened to Velikovsky had he not been a, a Ph.D. scholar. And he was, when he starts up, he says, this was, this was a theory from a psychiatrist. Well, Velikovsky was so much more than you, Carl. He had every kind of degree going. He knew everything about everything. And he had to. And he said, he made a statement, exactly the kind of statement I made. I did not want to trespass on everybody else's territory. But when they put me against the wall and said, no, you don't understand, you don't understand, you don't understand. I said, yes, I do. You don't understand. No, well, then you don't understand this. Oh, yes, I do. You don't understand. Well, maybe you don't understand this. Yes, I do. You don't understand. That's how I went down the line. Same thing with Velikovsky. Velikovsky, and these are the people that don't understand and refuse to understand. I'm sorry, Carl, I don't want to, you know, be nasty, but this is how everything has happened. And you have a very pleasant way of, of presenting, you know, what an idiot this guy was. Oh, yeah. Science is a self-correcting process. No, it isn't. To be accepted, new ideas must survive the most rigorous standards of evidence and scrutiny. That's exactly it. Evidence and scrutiny. I have the evidence. Nobody will scrutinize it. I've scrutinized it. I know what it is. The people that have done the tests and the DNA and the CAT scans and the anatomists and the chemistry, they don't know what it is. But nobody from your realm, sir, will look at it. The worst aspect of the Velikovsky affair is not that uh, many of his ideas were wrong or silly or in gross contradiction to the facts. Rather, the worst aspect is that some scientists attempted to suppress Velikovsky's ideas. The suppression of uncomfortable ideas may be common in religion or in politics, but it is not the path to knowledge, and there's no place for it in the endeavor of science. Exactly, Carl. And that's what I intend to change, because that is the, it's a dismissal system now, and if you come with evidence, as I have, DNA, CAT scans, specimens, um, and then relating it to the text. It's a broad, stretching coverage of all of these events and all of the um, aftermath and all of the writings that were written about. So this is where I need to debate somebody. Okay, this was from my other channel. I had to abandoned this channel. It was so destroyed by academia. This goes back to 2015 and um, this will give you a little background on Velikovsky. Here we go. Alright, this is about Velikovsky and his um, theory which was rejected violently and this goes back to 1972. This is not recent and it's still going on. Now listen to this. This is what we're up against. I need help. Things about the pressure that the scientific and scholarly community brought to bear is that it succeeded. What happened was they forced him to take his book off the bookshelf, bookshelves after being 11 weeks on the top seller list of number one. And uh, academia was so upset about the things he was saying because it, it overturned what they were saying. Basically, they didn't want to investigate it. They wanted him just to shut up, and they figured they would destroy him, and they basically did. He was, I'm sure he was successful enough having the books, and, and but he was not accepted as a scholar that he was it tra absolutely tragic and we fully don't understand everything because of the fact that this is still going on today here goes they destroyed the, the book where the world's in collision then merely the first of the books had been on the top of the bestseller list for something like 11 weeks and nonetheless the publisher was so uh, mortally wounded is the only word by the the uh, turning away of salesmen from the doors of, of professors' studies. So what happened was they said, you're from that publisher? Forget about it. Get out of here. We're, not, we're never going to do business with you again. You publish that kind of nonsense, you're done. And all of the implications that went with this, that the book was transferred to another publisher, which... 
All right, and the other publisher had nothing to do with academia, so they were, you know, they published it. But by that time, he had already been, you know, totally disgraced. And you, people don't know his name today. I wrote a book to try to preserve his image. Let me show you the book I wrote. Okay, this was from an interview done during the Velikovsky destruction of Velikovsky by academia. And listen to what he has to say. This is very enlightening, and it's still going on today. Not only was the scientific press copying at him, and in a way that was violent, not in terms of an order of discussion that this idea is yet to be tested and it takes more time and etc. But saying this idea is crazy and any man who has such an idea is mad, insane, that kind of thing. But the establishment through which men who think that way make a living, the academic establishment, was saying to this man, you know, you're not safe. Now, in the case of most of the young, being themselves unhappily is not... Dr. Berenbaum, president. He's talking about the young being themselves. They can't. They have to. They have to bow down. Literally bow down. If they don't repeat what they're told to say, they will ruin their lives. It's 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 really that cut and dry. President of Staten Island Community College. In the case of Velikovsky, there is something high, and the cost of being yourself has been very very great. That is a condition to which I think the young. Comfortably can be exposed. And if I had my way, every young undergraduate student in my college, every one, whether he's in the humanities or the hard sciences, would be required to examine the Velikovsky case. First, because the subject matter of what the man is standing for is very interesting. Very, very interesting. Secondly, because the subject matter is truly interdisciplinary. It's stretching. But third, because the human embodiment of the expression of the ideas, in a way, is symbolic of the problem the young think they are facing in this kind of a society, and which, in my opinion, they in fact are facing. In trans exam, me. He's right, because he, he, he will... I'm all running my mouth over this, but what he is saying is that he's stuck. He cannot, he cannot voice up. Or, or he'll be treated like Velikovsky. And the kids, they, they can't even say anything. They, if they say anything at all, boom, the, the dra grade goes right down in the toilet. I had to get out of that realm. I, I, I've shown my work many times over. I was in the physics, and I understand, I really understand what's going on. The core of the, the atom is not one big, you know, big protons. They're... Every proton is made out of 1,839 electrons. Electrons are dipoles. There's another thing they won't listen to, and we're going to go through that again, too. I'm going to push this stuff to the right, because we're being pushed back against by academia, still to this very day. I have every bit of evidence to support everything now that Velikovsky said, and I fully understand how all these mud fossils were preserved so, preserved so fabulously. That's a goose head. How could that possibly happen? It, there's his feathers. There's everything, there's his beak, there's his neck, it's all turned into basalt now, so how did that happen? It's flat on the back, why is that? Why is it flat like that? These all died in a flood, but still in a the flood they should rot away, you would think. Well, guess what? There was a boiling ocean situation when we had this cataclysm, and that's what Velikovsky uncovered. Every single culture on the face of the planet recorded the same events at the same time. Huge, giant floods, almost complete destruction of humanity. And that was what was written. And it was also written in the ancient text that they boiled the oceans at this time. Okay, let's continue on with what uh, the condition is saying. The extreme professionalization and rigidification of institutions through which thought is supposed to occur. Bully. Extreme to the point where it begins to contaminate the fluidity and looseness of the freedom to think. It's really destroyed the freedom to think. It's repeat what you're told to say or you will fail. So you, what are you going to do? You have to pay them a bunch of money to get a piece of paper that says you're intelligent because you can say what I told you to say. And if you don't say that, then I will fail you. 
So you either say what they tell you to say, or you're destroyed. Now, if somebody like me or Velikovsky, now Velikovsky was in the system. So he was a, a, a top academic, so he had no, they could not just dismiss him and walk away. He was so fully qualified that they had to respond, but the response was so, it was like you said, it was violent. They, were, they went after him with every single thing they could go to destroy him, and they did. And like I said, probably you have no idea who he was. Well, my book was written five, six years ago. At the same time, this was like 2015. Same time, I was really upset. I'll tell you, I was, by this time, I was furious. And I wrote my book, and I was really nasty, and, and um, I've gotten away from that. I, I realized that people's minds are so entrenched that it's, it's just not worth you know, getting upset about it. <laughs> they're going to change, they're going to change, they're not going to change. Well, that's the way they are. So let's continue on with my friend here. Fluidity and looseness of ideas, of having ideas, and the freedom to think. And Velikovsky really wasn't taken on by the establishment simply because of what he was saying. He was also taken on by the establishment, in my opinion, because of his audacity in having such thoughts. Exactly, they just can't handle it. Exactly. Anyway, let's, uh, let's go a little further. All right, this is from the Quran, which is why Allah will only make the sky to be cleft, which is that gouge, bam, asunder on the day when Allah will make the doomed day to come to the men. Why? Allah will only make the sky to be cleft asunder on a day when Allah will make the doom day to come to men because on the day when Allah wanted to make the doom day to come to men, Allah will make the sky or heavens be cleft asunder or to be torn apart. And when the sky or heavens will be made to be cleft asunder or to be torn apart, then the spaces which are between the earth and the throne of Allah will be made to become bare or will be made to become empty and on that day Allah will make about 11 angels to hold and to safeguard the throne of Allah from being destroyed together with the sky or together with the heavens. All right, this is all basically exactly what Velikovsky had and it was written everywhere. It says on that day when Allah has made the doom day to come to the men Allah will make the entire seven heavens and the entire seven continents of the earth to shake violently. And the violent shake of the seven heavens and seven continents of the earth will make the seven heavens to turn into pieces, which is the sky around the earth, will make the seven continents of the earth and entire men who are living on the seven continents of earth turn to dust. Allah told the Prophet Muhammad so to tell the entire mankind that when the stars will be made to fall down and when the stars which have been made to fall down to be made to be scattered in the sky, then the men should know that is the day when the doom day has come to men. Now, Allah told the Prophet Muhammad, this is where I have a little issue because Muhammad was after this 3,500 year event, uh, believe, you know, I mean, l let's talk about it, because this is what I want to do, is to try to understand it. Did, was, was Muhammad have been revealed something that had happened in the past, or something that will take place again, or are they two things that are going to be the same? Um, let's, let's just keep going, because this is basically exactly what Velikovsky said. Um, he didn't take it in a religious context. He just talk, talked to about it in a um, cosmological event of cataclysm, an absolute disaster. All the oceans literally boiled because the earth itself wrenched and crushed from this almost, in, almost a crushing impact, but it glanced off. The oceans just swelled everywhere, and because of the crushing of the fabric of the earth, the b waters boiled from the bottom of the ocean, it was said. The boiling came from underneath the bottom of the ocean in a lot of cases. Now, I have mud fossils here, and I've always wondered how could they possibly see so absolutely flawless. And I knew every one of them had a flat side, which indicated to me that they were in the flood. And I just thought, well, it must have been uh, this and that. And I did some, I did some um, testing, and I got them to sort of turn into what I would consider 
you know, they would they would eventually become mud fossils. But I believe now that my particular area here was hit with a a boiling ocean situation and it boiled these creatures into a like a condition where they didn't rot the, the what happens when you're alive is every molecule in your body is in a state of transition because it's taken on oxygen given up carbon dioxide taken on glucose given up this and that wastes and you know all the maintenance of your body the cells have to be maintained on a, every second basis now w when you die that stops and oxidation and all kind of molecular explosions happen inside your body basically and that's why you have all this effluent runs out the black and, and red fluids run out of the body and it's it's really nasty and, and that's what happens after you die that it's the de decomposition process now if you're boiled though and you take a chicken and you boil it and you put it on a counter, it, you know, and it's like parboiled. It's not going to do that right away. Eventually, a long time it would take, but it would go bad, yes. But if it was in an ocean and it was laying at the bottom of an ocean flat like this in the mud, and then when it dried out, It'd be flawless, and all my stuff is, and they are giants, and some of them are absolutely enormous, and they are also DNA tested as having mitochondrial, which is the mother's side DNA, and then I have them our size. Hold on. Uh, here it is. This is one that was DNA tested. That's a lung, and no question whatsoever, it's a lung, and it is as flat as a pancake on that side, just flat as can be, and. The guy died like this. Now, why is this just a lung hanging over here and not part of a body? This is, again, you you cook a chicken or cooks anything, you could strip the stuff right off of the bones, you can strip the organs out and the whole nine yards. It finally makes sense, 100%. You know, I was going to originally call this fascia-facilitated fossilization because this is fascia. It's a pleura on a lung, but it's still fascia. This is also collagen let's go collagen because collagen makes the fascia and collagen makes the feathers collagen makes your skin collagen makes your membranes and collagen is basically keeps everything separated and everything fluid and everything motion and you know it keeps you in good shape and it's it it doesn't get destroyed by salts that's the key between animals and plants plants did not do well in the great flood um, because first of all they were boiled and secondly salts invade cellulose and destroy it and and also there was absolutely cataclysmic fires all over the earth if you read Velikovsky it'll blow your mind and he did the research he did not just guess he did the research and because he did the actual research they, they this is what upset him because he had the, he had the facts and they just could not accept that and I have the facts and <laughs> Same thing happened to me. And now this goes back, well, I don't know, this, this is about Allah. That goes way back. <laughs> My, here's what I did. I wrote a book about Velikovsky. I was real upset about Velikovsky being treated the way he was. And um, so I wrote this book about it. And um, I didn't want any money for it. I just wanted to make sure that he did not get forgotten. And I called it Mud Fossils and Velikovsky and Mines in collision. He wrote worlds in collision, <laughs> which is the clefting of the earth and a cataclysm that caused all these mud fossils. And it was written, but was it written before or written after? This is where I'm getting a little confused now, because the Bible is after. The Quran, you know, is, is, is a little after this event, I believe. We need to talk these things through. We need to figure out what happened when, who knew what when, where did these events happen on the earth? Why is this biology turned into stone? You know, a lot of this stuff, and, and lungs can be, well, I have another one here somewhere. There's one here. See, they can be, this was boiled in some kind of acid solution, probably. That's another lung. You see the red blood that was inside iron oxides? That's a lung. And, and but it, it had some other chemical invasion that this one did not. So, there are, everywhere on the earth it was different. 
different different types of of petrification during this event but the creatures were absolutely astronomically large and i wrote about this back then and i was i i had the evidence i figured for sure they're going to watch and listen and, and everybody be fine with it but no they weren't <laughs> <laughs> I put the discovery of mud fossils a few years ago led on a journey that can only be described as wild and crazy. Evidence uncovered is discussed in many links to videos that prove the claims I made. Hundreds of samples eventually completely scrutinized, many scientifically tested in a variety of ways, DNA, um, the whole thing. Now, here's the book. Now, here's some of the text from it. Whoops. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm not good with this stuff. Boom. All right. Now, why can't I go back up here? I can't. I'm going to have to use these arrows. See, I'm learning. I'll learn. Come on. Come on, let's go. There we go. I can't get back to this thing. All right, here's Introduction to Mud Fossils and Velikovsky and Mines in Collision. I said I had a dream there were giants all over the earth. They were as tall as mountains, and all of a sudden Jupiter gave birth to Venus. And that's what it says. The feared god Jupiter gave birth to Venus. And right out, right out of the red spot, the giant red spot, in a normal vaginal way, and after birth spewed into space and fell on Earth as red powdered blood. It was all over Earth. You have to read Velikovsky. These were accounts everywhere written, and even in the Bible, too. And then the stones fell, and then the milk and honey fell. There was giant chunks of meat in space, 750,000 times bigger than us. And I show this, I, and I'm, I can show this, Comet 67P is a tendon anthesis, no question whatsoever. And they have been out there, and they had a fillet lander on there. I followed it from the day they left to the day they gave up and walked away and just said, let's stop talking about it because it's too scary. Now, comets of meat are streaming barbecue gases as they flew by. Astronaut suits smell like steak when they go out into space. When they come back into the into the hangar there, they take their suits off and they say, boy, it smells like a sirloin. Meteors have veins and arteries. Absolutely, I have them here. Water had a memory and light was actually a fluid, which it is. It is a, it's almost like raindrops coming out, feeding everything. The sun fed the solar system with electrons. And then I keep going on and on and on. And on. Anyway, and um, I don't know, maybe you can read the whole thing here. But anyway, this is... Um, this upset me, and I figured, well, I'm going to put a book out about him, and when I show my evidence, it's all over. No, not allowed. Can't show the evidence. Okay, I, at this point, when I was posting all that stuff, I had all my DNA tests done. These are mud fossils. There's, that's a bone, and any anatomist, and I've had anatomists look at it, no question. Yes, sir, you are correct. That's a fingertip from a giant human being, and that has been DNA tested. It's on this report right now, and that's the bottom pad, just like you have. That's the apical tuft, if you have anybody that is, uh, here's another one. It's completely eroded. These are the apical tufts. They sit right at the tip of the finger, which is called the distal phalanges, and these little balls are locked in all the tendons, and those straps run all down off of that ball which is this and that's what allows your finger to really do some pulling and gripping and all that now this is where the bone was in the back and it's been cat scanned and DNA tested and everything else so that's a giant fingertip and I have the palm I have a lot of stuff from that now of course you know about Caesar my buddy here Caesar Augustus he's a goose now all of these things appear to be pretty much flat on one side. Now, this, this test was very sophisticated and very conclusive. There was three samples, a 36 inch and a lung and a mud tip. The mud tip was this thing here. All right, and then the 36 inch tip, I'll show you in a second, and then the lung was what I showed you before, that lung. Now, I extracted the DNA from these and sent them to them. What they tested was what I sent them. If I faked it, then I'm, I'm a liar and a fraud, and that is not the case. 
This is all, this, and this, I believe, was the first ancient DNA test done in the world that I know of. Um, and again, this goes back five, six, maybe seven years. Uh, six years, I guess. Anyway, it came all down to here. And I, I drilled right into the artery. And I know how to get into the artery, these things. They, they, they're, they're just like us. They have arteries, they have veins. I took out, well, it was excellent quality DNA obtained from the 36 inch tip and the lung. Those were the best. This was not quite as good because this turned into basically mud. You know, you, you, it's hard to really see a lot of blood in this, but I did get enough uh, DNA out of that to make it, it, it absolutely certain. He said, there's no question, all three of them were 100% human DNA. There was two that were the best, was the 36 inch and the lung. So I'll show you, I showed you the lung. We're going to look at the 36 inch one. Now, and he went down, this is not a simple test. This was all the CTAGs, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the double helix DNA, all that business. And, and these were the different sequences, and they were, you know, it's a certified test, verified by the lab director, Helix Biolabs, and this was also, they did something else at another lab, uh, Eaton, uh, Eaton Biosciences, I don't know what they did to that, they sequenced it there, did something, I don't know, it was a pretty advanced test, and that was back in um, 2015. So that's that part okay this is one of the ones that said excellent quality dna and it was this this particular finger um i guess that's where the fingernail was i broke off a piece off the side here to try to get into where the blood was because it was it's absolutely flawless i mean it is just perfect and um and i have the fingerprint side which i sent off well i, I drilled up to get blood out of it and there's a ton of blood in fingers and here's the side that has the fingerprints and um <laughs> this is what it is now and it comes off like in a pad it's this was oh maybe that thick and there's the sweat pores just like you have on your hand and these are the ridges fingerprint ridges my thumb is about the width of one fingerprint ridge. So this was a very good sized creature. And it was absolutely flawlessly preserved, as is almost all my stuff. And here's the hand. I was in a real situ strange situation. Here's the rest of the hand from, well, not all entirely, but I have knuckles and I have other fingers. And actually I have toe, uh, a toe from this one too. Uh, anyway, this is the... The hand, it's, I don't know, 36 inches wide for four feet, something like that. And um, <laughs> it's your left hand. Put your left hand out like that. You're going to have your pad going around here just like this. Huh? That little jobber there runs down for like a tendon. And this is the grip skin on this one. Remember I showed you the grip skin on the other one, how it peeled off? This is not thick like the other one was because this is much smaller than the other hand. The other hand was just the, the, just the fingertip itself. All right, this, this is a fingertip from this one. All right, the fingertip from the bigger one is almost three feet long its own self. <laughs> this one here is, I don't know what, it's seven or eight inches long, something like that. But it's, um, the other one is three feet long. So the creature was 150 feet tall or so. And it's human, no question. Excellent quality DNA. Excellent quality DNA. I have CAT scans showing the fingertips. I, you know, there's no way to deny what I am saying. So the only way that the academics have now is to just disregard what I am saying. And they have done that quite successfully for 10 years. And um, unless you stand up and speak up, it'll just continue on and they will just not be talking about truth because it relates to God and Allah and things in the past that were a little bit scary to be perfectly honest with you and are they coming again I don't know it, are they, were they revelations was it revealing something of the past or is it revealing something of the future or are the two events going to be working together I have no idea I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a, a hardcore guy looking at hardcore evidence of what I see in front of me what I can test what I can verify what I can do chemistry on and then I look at the ancient text and I say 
Does this make sense? And it does. It makes 100% sense to me now. I'm really fully feeling like I'm really getting into a good understanding of what happened in the past material-wise and how they viewed it. Now, there's no question in my mind now that there's gods and there's a supreme god and he had sub-gods, you know, demigods, lower gods. And now I also have come across some some recent stuff working with with other people that there might be courts as you die and you go to the court and say well that's what you did in your previous life here's how we're how, here's how we're going to deal with you. you you were you did this you did this you did it but then you did that and you did this and you did that so yeah you're all right we're going to let you do this and that court will make a decision on the soul of that person and send them to some reality that is either good, bad, or terrible. And um, I think, and I, and I don't see any reason to discount that at all. Um, I'm trying to get through to people from different faiths, Islam, you know, Muslim people, and, you know, um, all the different believers in in these things because they've been the ones that have been dismissed as you know I just mythical you know people that are just making up things they, they they just have to have something to believe in well I believe in material facts and I think I've shown that there is a very 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 high likelihood that these events happened in the past well, there's, there's no question in my mind. If anybody can dispro disprove me, that's what I want. I want somebody to debate me, talk about it. They, yeah, stay away, stay away from that guy. And I know why. I crush him. I, there's nobody. Nobody can stand up against me. Nobody. If you think you can, come on. I've asked all of them to debate me. I put it out for years, 10 years. Zero will respond. And it's fully. I, I fully understand why. But I, I, I just can't understand how they're so successful at hiding from this for this amount of time. When with this amount of evidence, I would think they'd be really worried about being sued for fiduciary failure and have to refund all the money from these colleges. I would think that I, I would want my money back. But that's just me.